Uh, thank you. I'll uh, be back Thursday. With that casual goodbye, Colonel Cavanaugh left Gaylord's and stepped into a waiting car. Inside was his cohort, Hameen. The musical box is there being sold. What a pity for you, my dear Colonel. Is it my fault that the message reached us only an hour ago? Is it my fault that they were sold? She can't hold me responsible for that. I hope for your sake you're right. As Colonel Kavanaugh and Hameen pondered their next move, another conversation was taking place at 221B Baker Street. As Dr. Watson, immersed in his reading, was interrupted by his famous colleague, Sherlock Holmes. I take it the new issue of the Strand Magazine is out, containing another of your slightly lurid tales. Indeed? And what do you call this one? I call it a Scaramel in Bohemia. On the bad title, huh? Hmm. If you must record my exploits, I do wish you'd put less emphasis on the melodramatic and more on the intellectual issues involved. More on the intellectual... What do you mean by that? Well, I do hope you've given uh, the woman a soul. She had one, you know. By the woman? I suppose you mean Irene Adler. Yes. I shall always remember her as the woman. As the two colleagues spoke... Julian Emery, a boyhood chum of Dr. Watson's, climbed the stairs to pay a friendly visit. Come in. I think. That's the old boy. How are you? How are you, old boy? I haven't seen you for years. I want you to meet my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, it's a stinky. Uh, In other words, uh, uh, Julian Emery. How are you doing, Mr. Emery? Uh, Watson has often spoken of you. Oh, has he? <laughs> yes, we were at school together. Yes, more years ago than I can't remember, but you didn't come in here just to remind me of that. No, I just happened to be in the neighborhood and saw your lights burning, so I took the liberty of looking you up. Still writing your mystery stuff? Yes, yes there's a new one out this week. <laughs> good, I never miss them. Oh, good, thanks. I say that bandage makes you look very interesting. Still poking your nose into other people's business as usual? <laughs> Who hit you? I haven't the foggiest notion. Somebody knocked me on the head in my own living room. And then proceeded to commit the most idiotic burglary you ever heard of. <laughs> Fellow must have been barmy as a coot. Barmy? Why? <laughs> Come sit down, old boy. Thank hey. you. You like a cup of tea? Huh? Oh, all right. I'll go and tell Mrs. Yeah. Why do you say the robbery was idiotic, Mr. Emery? Oh, simply for the fact that uh, with about 5,000 pounds worth of musical boxes in my living room, the thief who I caught in the act made off with one that isn't even worth 5 pounds. I gather you're a collector of musical boxes. Yes, I am indeed. Some of them very beautiful, but not the one that was stolen. The thief uh, evidently grabbed the first thing that came to his hand when he heard me coming into the room. It's just rather odd, isn't it, that having disposed of you, he didn't pick up something more valuable. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything unusual about the stolen box? No, nothing at all. No, I, I picked it up in the south of France oh, several years ago. You see, you have many valuable music boxes. And yet the thief made off one that isn't worth five pounds. Sounds like rather an intriguing little problem. <laughs> As well, I take it that he was just an ordinary petty thief and didn't know the value. That is a possible explanation, and yet I venture to say that the average petty thief has a more extensive knowledge of the value of object d'art than the average collector. <laughs> well, anyway, that's got in the odd theory. They didn't get very excited about it. That's consistent, anyway. I wonder if I might see your collection, Mr. Emery. Oh, of course you could, yes. Uh, nothing that a collector likes more than showing off his clothes. Uh, when will it suit you? No time like the present. Good. My place is just round in Portman Square. Shall we? Yes, right. Oh, where are you going? Stinky hasn't had his tea yet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going round to my place. Well, I'm going to give you something better than tea. <laughs> so together, Julian, Stinky Emery, Dr. Watson, and Sherlock Holmes all went to see a most impressive music box collection. Stupid thing. Singing rabbit. How would you say offhand is a valuable box like that, Mr. Emery? Well, it's hard to say offhand, but I think we'll bring about five or six hundred pounds today. It's the gem of my collection. A thief who steals an oddity like a musical box passes up one worth 500 pounds for one of almost no value at all. Odd. What was a stolen box like, Mr. Emery? Oh, just a plain wooden box about um, so big. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have one over here almost exactly like it. I picked this up yesterday at an auction room in Knightsbridge. (laughs) Paid only two pounds for it. Of course, I wouldn't have the ordinary way add one like this to my collection, but the, um, the tune intrigued me. I'd never heard it before. (laughs) 
You have a remarkable ear for music, Holmes. Rather an unusual melody. Sit down, good. Thanks. You, uh, you see, you bought that box at an auction show yesterday. Yes, the Gaylord auction rooms in uh, Knightsbridge. At what time was the robbery committed? Oh, about uh, three o'clock this morning. You know, Miss Emery, that box and the robbery might well be cause and effect, hmm? especially since you say that the stolen box outwardly resembles this one a great deal. And uh, Scotland Yard were not particularly interested, eh? Oh, yes, but I, I wouldn't blame them for that, especially as I told them I was quite unable to describe the thief. Except, of course, for the fact that uh, it was definitely a man. All you remember is that you came in here and someone struck him on the head. Yes, and the next thing I knew, my man was trying to revive me. Mm, it might be wise for you to put that box away somewhere and lock it up. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. Besides, everything's insured. Well, at least if any further attempts at robbery are made, I'd suggest that you call the police rather than running into any personal danger. Oh, well, come home. Aren't you being a bit of an alarmist? Possibly. Well, well Mr. Gray, old stinky. Seems to me you are making a rather mountain out of the mosque. Mole Hill is the word, old boy, and it's time you were in bed. <laughs> Thanks so much for letting us see your place. How's this? Been glad meeting you. And with that, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson returned home to 221B Baker Street. Oh, I can't understand why you were so mysterious. Seems to me that petty thief explanation was the only sensible one. Really? I can't see how you can believe it was anything else. I didn't say I believed it to be anything else. The petty thief theory is the obvious one, I grant you. However, it's often a mistake to accept something as true merely because it's obvious. The truth is only arrived at by the painstaking process of eliminating the untrue. We are not able to do that in this case without further data. Rubbish, you're pulling my leg. You're trying to turn a... A couple of hate robbery into an international plot. No, I'm not. I just hope that your friend Stinky is a little more cautious in the future. Just in case. Dress to Kill, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, will return after these messages. It's time again for the Nordic Track Ski Challenge. Today, our challenger is the ever-popular exercise bicycle. This is quite a matchup, folks. After all, the bicycle offers you a great easy-on-the-knees workout, same as the Nordic Track Ski, but only one machine can hold the title, the world's best aerobic exerciser. And we're here to find out which one, with a little help from a 280-calorie carrot muffin. We now return to our classic movies on radio presentation, Dress to Kill. After saying goodbye to Sherlock Holmes and old friend Dr. Watson, Julian Emery was preparing to retire for the evening when... Yeah? Julian Emery here. Who? <laughs> I, I, of course I remember you, Mrs. Courtney. <laughs> yes, yes, you're the one bright spot that they're affording the dull affair of Lady Sanford. <laughs> huh? It's not too late to come around. Yes, I'd like to give you a drink. I tell you what, come straight up and I'll leave the door unless. Right, that's what? Fifteen minutes? Good. <laughs> I shall be counting each one. <laughs> no, I mean that, really. <laughs> right, goodbye. Soon, much to the delight of an infatuated Julian Emery, the elegant and mysterious Mrs. Hilda Courtney arrived. I know I shouldn't have called you so late. But I was at a party just around the corner, and I remembered your invitation to see your collection of musical boxes. My dear Mrs. Courtney, the pleasure is all the greater for being so unexpected. <laughs> My friends call me Hilda. <laughs> Thanks. Mine call me Stinky. Stinky, how quaint. Oh, what a perfectly wonderful collection of musical boxes. You know, when you told me you had a collection, I had no idea it was so attractive. <laughs> yes. They appeal to the ear as well as to the uh, eye. Oh, what a plain little one. I was just like a country cousin amid all this grandeur. No, 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 no. You mustn't underestimate the country cousin. I only last night a burger burger in here, and with all these to choose from, I went off with one very much like it. Really? Yes, I don't mind the loss of the box so much. But I do resent this crack on the skull. But it makes you look so interesting. Oh, do you think so? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that's what little Satso said. Satso? I mean, uh, Dr. Watson. He was here this evening with a friend, a Mr. Holmes. He's interested in my collection, too. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Do you know him? I've heard of him. Yes, he, he seems to think I'm in some sort of uh, danger. What a haunting tune. It takes me right back to my childhood. You heard me? <laughs> you know, it's odd that you should be interested in that particular musical box. Odd? Why? Because Mr. Holmes is also interested in it. <laughs> he may have been more interested in the tune than in the box. I hear you, yes, that's right. I remember now, he whistled it note for note, having heard it only once. Really? 
He must be a remarkable man. <laughs> it wouldn't allow me to be asked me. Don't you believe in warnings? <laughs> of course not. Who'd want a box like that? I would. You're not serious. Oh, but I am. Well, you, you put me in a very awkward position. I'm a collector, you know. And the collector buys but never sells. But if the price were high enough... <laughs> Price and nothing to do with it. It's the principle of the thing. <laughs> yes, well, we haven't had our drink. No, thanks. I must be getting along. Not you, Annie. I'm afraid so. You're not walking out on me, are you? My reputation. Stinky. <laughs> I say, you know, you are an attractive woman. Thanks. Silently, a figure emerged from the shadows, cradling a dagger in the palm of his meaty hand. It was Hameen. With a deft flick of the wrist, the knife slammed with deadly accuracy into the back of Julian Emery. You fool. I told you to wait outside. What did you have to kill him for? All I had to do was walk out with it. He held you in his arms. Don't touch him. Don't touch anything. Now get out. I'm sorry. You're sorry. What about me? This is murder. What about Scotland Yard? What about Sherlock Holmes? Now get out. Taking the music box, Mrs. Courtney stepped over the lifeless body of Julian Emery and with Hameen returned to Colonel Kavanaugh's waiting car. Did you get it? Good. Did you have any uh, trouble with him? Just a matter of murder. With Julian Emery dead and the mysterious music box stolen, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson joined Scotland Yard at the scene of the murder. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Hopkins. Thanks for coming so promptly. Inspector Lestrade suggested that I call through to you. Mr. Emery was the client of Mr. Holmes, Inspector. Indeed. You didn't mention that when I telephoned you, Mr. Holmes? Well, not exactly a client, Inspector. Sergeant Thompson? He was killed between the hours of 11 and 2 o'clock this morning, Mr. Holmes. Must have been someone he knew, someone of whom he had no suspicion. Poor old Stinky. It's all my fault. I should have prevented this. My wife no time to start talking about that now, Doctor. Apparently it's gone. That's the second attempt on the musical box that Emery bought at the auction sale. And this time it was successful. But that box is only worth two pounds. It was worth a man's life, Watson. I think we'd better pay a visit to Gaylord's auction room and let the crab tree. Inspector, may I suggest that you make a complete search of this flat for a small, plain, musical box about that size? Thank you. Come on, Watson. Their next stop, Gaylord's auction room. The same affair in the first box went to Mr. Julian Emery. The second, Mr. Kilgore, 143 B. Hampton Way. And the third to the unidentified young lady who presumably has a shop and lives near Golders Green. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Isn't it rather strange, Mr. Crabtree? You should have had three identical musical boxes all playing the same tune. Where'd they come from? Dartmoor Prison. Dartmoor? Yeah, we get a regular shipment from there every month. The inmates manufacture them. They make all kinds of things, you know, pipe racks, waste paper baskets, musical boxes. Did you happen to notice if anyone showed any particular interest during the auction in the purchases of these three boxes? Oh, come on, Mr. Crabtree. This is very literally a matter of life and death. Well, since you put it that way, Mr. Holmes... There was a gentleman came in here about an hour after closing time, and he was in a, an awful state, he was. He came to five pounds to tell him where the boxes had gone to. He said they had a sentimental value for him, sir. Hmm, expensive sentiment. Can you describe him? Well, he was tall, distinguished looking, and he had gray hair and a mustache. He was quite a gentleman, sir. Now, what was his reaction when you were unable to supply him with the address of the young lady who owned the shop? I told him the young lady usually come back on Thursday. He said he'd come back on Thursday. Now, that's tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Crabtree. You've been very helpful. Thank you. Come on, Watson. Where are we going now, Holmes? Well, I'm on Mr. Kilgore. The men aboard the third box. Arriving at the home of William Kilgore, Holmes and Watson were greeted by the Kilgore charwoman. Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore at home? No. When do you expect them? Oh, in an hour or so. There's no use you're hanging about. They don't buy nothing from peddlers. Peddlers? My good woman, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Oh, go on. Do you mind if we come in and wait? <clears throat> My business is rather urgent. Well, I've got to go out and do my shopping. And I don't know if Mrs. Kilgore would like any strangers nosing about. Quite all right, I assure you. Well, I've got to be off. In two ways in the parlor. And no smoking either. Mrs. Kilgore said it smells up the house. Oh, 
funny old girl, Holmes. Hmm. <laughs> Holmes, I've been thinking. There must have been something hidden in that box from old Stinkies. Stolen jewelry, possibly. What's up, Holmes? Listen. What's this, the steam and the water pipes? Steam and water pipes? Holmes knew better. Those sounds were coming from the hallway closet where the Kilgore's daughter had been gagged and tied. Wait, Scott! Come on, Holmes. Get on the chair here. It's all right, my dear. There, there, there. Now, don't worry. It's all over. Oh, you are. You don't cry anymore. She tied me up and shut me in the cupboard. I know, I know. She won't come back. Did you show her your new musical box? Yes, she said she wanted to hear it play. And as soon as I showed it to her, she grabbed all the... Oh, I know, I know. Now, don't worry, nobody. We'll buy you a new musical box. Yes, my dear, the best one in London. What? Oh, what a fool, what a fool I've been. What do you mean, Holmes? She took the musical box out of this house and that monkey basket. Why don't our very noses? Why could the, the Kilgore charwoman want to take the music box? She isn't the Kilgore charwoman. She's a consummate actress. An extremely clever, unscrupulous woman who will stop at nothing. Take care of her child, will you, Wolf? Alone until, until our parents get back. Explain everything to them. Of course, will. Holmes, where are you going? Somewhere, somehow. I must get to the young lady who bought that third musical box before our opponents find out. I only hope that I won't be too late. Dress to Kill will return in a moment. Hope you are enjoying it. tonight's class. Now, let's get back to our Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dress to Kill, on Classic Movies on Radio. The following Thursday, the young woman who had bought the second music box made another appearance at Gaylord's auction room. This time, however, she was being followed. When she returned to her modest toy shop, a pair of new customers came calling. Hilda Courtney and Colonel Kavanaugh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm looking for a birthday gift for a seven-year-old girl. What would you suggest? We have some lovely dolls. Now, this Hungarian... I think she has enough dolls already. Books are always welcome. Well, I'm looking for something a little different. Well, that's rather cute. Uh, what is it? Well, that's a musical box. Children always love them. And this is an exceptionally nice one. It says many tunes. Have you any others? Yes. If you'll just get this way. I have only two left. A nice. Are you sure this is all you have? I'm sorry. It's rather hard to find, you know. That's the entire allotment. I did have one other, but I sold it earlier this afternoon. But it was only a plain wooden one. It wouldn't have been a very nice gift for a child. Really? Do you happen to know who the purchaser was? Why, yes. He left his card, just in case anyone should inquire for him. The name on that card? Sherlock Holmes. How interesting. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I have to look a bit further. Thank you, anyway. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Driving away from the toy shop with the second music box, Hilda Courtney and Colonel Kavanaugh soon realized they were being followed. Meanwhile, back at Scotland Yard. No photograph of her, Commissioner, as I expected. She's not a known criminal. But how do you expect to know if you do find her? After all, she was disguised as, as a charwoman. Don't worry, old fellow. If I ever see it again, I'll recognize her. Well, it won't be long till we know who they are and from where they operate. Who's covering them? Uh, Sergeant Thompson following them, sir. They won't get away from him. He's a good man. We could have arrested them at Clifford's toy shop if we had any proof. But we know that they killed Emra. Proof, my dear fellow. We must have proof. We have x-rayed it, sir. There's nothing whatever concealed in the box. We'll have a look at the plate. Probably was so obvious that we've all overlooked it. Seems to me we're up against a bunch of lunatics. Not lunatics, my dear fellow. Extremely astute, cold-blooded murderers. What could these little musical boxes have in them that's so important? Don't forget, they were made in Dartmoor Prison. 
They can smuggle stuff into prison, but not out. Do you want us to break the box apart, sir, to see if there's anything the X-ray hasn't caught? No, not yet. Do you mind if I take it? Certainly. Thanks. The governor of Dartmoor Prison informed us, sir, in answer to Mr. Holmes' uh, question, that all three musical boxes were made by the same convict, John Davidson, serving a seven-year term, sir. Davidson? The Bank of England place. That'll be all. Yes, sir. Now we're getting somewhere. If... Wait a minute. How did you know about the place, Mr. Holmes? I'm a student of crime, Inspector. I make it my business to know about such things. And when the name of Davidson was mentioned... Oh, who is this fellow Davidson? As long as Mr. Holmes seems to know all about it already, I suppose there's no harm in telling you. Uh, two years ago in London, there occurred a robbery of such tremendous importance, uh, although the stolen articles themselves have no intrinsic value whatsoever, that the Home Secretary was instrumental in seeing that not a word of it appeared in any newspaper. But you never told me anything about this, Holmes? You were away at the time. Articles of no intrinsic value and yet of such importance... <laughs> I don't understand. Davidson was apprehended within 15 minutes of committing the theft. But by that time, he'd hidden the articles in question and they've yet to be found. Before going further, Dr. Watson, I must inform you that this matter is not to be mentioned outside of this room. Of course not. Do I look like a man who gossip? Let's not go into that now, old fellow, shall we? Davidson had been employed for years in a position of extreme trust by the engraving department of the Bank of England. The articles he stole were nothing less and a complete duplicate set of plates for printing five-pound notes. What? The Bank of England's own plates? Precisely. And with those plates, a gang of crooks could flood England with five-pound notes, not forged in the usual sense of the word, but notes undetectable from genuine Bank of England notes in any way whatsoever. Good heavens. Any whisper at all might have resulted in enormous damage in shaking public confidence in the Treasury. We tried everything after we arrested Davidson. Offered him a shorter sentence if he'd tell us where he'd hidden the plates. Why, we even put in Scotland Yard men with him as cellmates, but no result. Obviously, Davidson is a man of strong character and infinite patience. Yet suddenly he feels impelled to smuggle out the secret of the hiding place of the plates to his confederates. Why? I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Well, for example, has the Bank of England made any plans to radically change the design of the five-pound notes so that in, say, uh, seven years from now, notes made from the stolen plates would be worthless? Confidentially, Mr. Holmes, such a move was discussed. But replacing all the five-pound notes in circulation would be such a Herculean task that nothing's been done about it as yet. I see. Of course, there is another possible explanation. Davidson didn't have much time to find a hiding place before he was captured. He may be afraid that the plates will be accidentally discovered before he's released. Hence his anxiety to communicate their whereabouts to his confederates as soon as possible. I believe you hit it, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure that the message is contained in this musical box. Or rather, in all three musical boxes, since possession of all three seems to be essential. Our opponents have two-thirds of the puzzle, we have one-third. Well, what are you going to do, Holmes? Try to deduce the message from the one third that we have. one played by Emery's musical box. And yet it's different. Sounds the same to me. The tune. Somehow the tune is the key to the mystery. It must be the tune. Otherwise, why use three musical boxes to convey the message? Why not collar boxes or shoe boxes? Yes? For you, Inspector. Oh, thank you, sir. Inspector Hopkins speaking. What? Where? Golders Green Station reports they've just found Sergeant Thompson's body. From the tire marks on his clothes, he was apparently run over by a taxi. 
What an unfortunate accident. Not an accident, my dear fellow. I'm afraid it's murder. Dress to Kill, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, will return after these messages. It's time again for the Nordic Track Ski Challenge. Today, our challenger is the ever-popular exercise bicycle. This is quite a matchup, folks. After all, the bicycle offers you a great easy-on-the-knees workout, same as the Nordic Track Ski, but only one machine can hold the title, the world's best aerobic exerciser. And we're here to find out which one, with a little help from a 280-calorie carrot muffin. Ladies and gentlemen, fans of the scary Count Floyd, it's with the... Now, let's get back to our Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dress to Kill, on Classic Movies on Radio. Now, what gentlemen, is judged by his appearance. Yes, the gentleman is judged by how he comes. Now, he's much better off when he's acting feel like a cop, especially if he's taking him a walk. What on earth is this outlandish place? A rendezvous for actors. Actors? Mm. Buskers, old boy. You've seen them a thousand times. Actors who entertain the queues. Waiting outside theaters. How are you, Joe? Now what happened? And yourself? Fine, thank you. I want you to meet a friend of mine, Dr. Watson, Joe Sisto. Oh, well, any friend of Mr. Holmes is a friend of mine. Hi, uh, Joe. He did me a good turn once that I'll never forget. Yes, I cleared Joe of a most unpleasant charge. Murder, no less. Oh, really? Try proving to the satisfaction of the police that he was busy at the time, blowing open someone's safe. That's right, Governor. Good gracious me. Uh, Joe, uh, now you can help me. I want you to identify a song for me. Oh, there ain't a song that's been written that I don't know. That's why I can't, Joe. Of course, the violin is more my instrument, but, um... Oh, well. Here we go. Now, listen to this, Joe. Wait a minute. You're playing that wrong. That should be E natural, not E flat. You know the song? Oh, yes. It's an old Australian song called, uh, The Swagman. But you're playing it all wrong. That's what I hoped you'd say. Now listen again, Joe. That's the same tune, all right. But you're making different mistakes than you did the first time. No, not mistakes, Joe. Call them variations. Yeah. Play the song for me. We know the way it's written. down for me, the way it was originally written. Oh, sure, I'm it down. But it'll take a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Here, Lale. Hey, Lale. Come on, up to it. Along with it. After obtaining the notes and lyrics to the music box's melody, Holmes and Watson returned home to 221B Baker Street. Well, obviously it isn't the lyrics. No combination of those words made any sense at all. The variations in the way Emily's musical box played the tune are different from the variations in the one we have. You sure? Quite. You see, I took the trouble to memorize the tune as played by Emily's box. That night we were with him in his flat. Oh, oh you were amazed with it. Let me mention, my dear fellow, one of the first principles in solving crime is never to disregard anything, no matter how trivial. But why are there three boxes? Why not one? Because the message was obviously too long to be conveyed by any one variation. Then there's the third box. The one that woman took from the Kilgars. That contains yet another set of variations. Yes, so it's all beyond me. 
All we have to do now is to find the secret of the variations. Not a very easy problem to solve, my dear fellow. Hello. What's up? Their offices have been ransacked. We've had company. The young lady. The one who said you wanted her to wait for you. And a nice looking old gentleman. Our friends again, Watson. Friends? What did the young lady look like? Oh, I I couldn't see her face. She had a a heavy black veil on. But she had such a nice way with her. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, if I've done anything wrong. But you did say I should always let clients come in and wait for you. Don't worry, Mrs. Hudson. Don't worry. You had no way of knowing. It's quite all right, quite all right. Now, don't worry, Mrs. Hudson. Don't worry. Where on earth's the musical box? They didn't get it. Didn't get it? Where is it? It's in your hand. Huh? In a biscuit jar. Take the biscuits off the top. Now, put your hand inside, and you'll find the music box. Well done, Holmes. Well done. Amazing. <laughs> As Watson listened to the tinkly sounds of the music box, Holmes was looking for clues. And he found one, in the form of a cigarette carelessly left behind. A night of sleepless pondering followed. I said, Holmes. What? It's morning. Allow me to congratulate you on a brilliant bit of deduction. It's not a transposition, not a polygraph transposition, not a trigraph. Or any known form of decoding. How about the Morse code? Have you tried that? Yes, at about three o'clock this morning. I'm sorry, old man. I was going to try to help. Oh, uh, do me a favor. Not again. I must have heard that thing a thousand times. Can be awake all night. A distinguished composition, I grant you. No, perfectly well, I don't know one tune from the other. When I was a kid, my people tried to have me taught the piano. I've always felt sorry for that old teacher of mine. The poor old girl finally reached the point of numbering the keys for me. One, two, three, four. Even then, I, I never progressed beyond the... Numbering the keys, Watson. The 19th key of the keyboard is the 19th letter of the alphabet. Yes. Yeah. Come on, sit down and give it to the old fellow, will you? First of note. Right here, yes, first. Now, the eighth the key is H. The fifth key, E. The twelfth key, L. The sixth key, F. S H E L F. Shelf. <laughs> Your piano lessons are not in vain, old fellow. You've solved it. Thank you. Once again, it was back to Scotland Yard. We now have two-thirds of the message behind books. Third shelf secretary, Dr. Pierce. Presumably, these are the first and second portions of the message. And this gang has the first and third parts of it. Precisely. Then it's a stalemate? Yes, Commissioner, but we can't leave it like that. There's no doubt in my mind that they'll try to secure our third of the message that's missing. Well, I assume you've taken every precaution to guard the Clifford music. Oh, yes, it's carefully hidden at Baker Street with Dr. Watson on guard. However, I'm reasonably certain that, uh, difficult as it may be, we can find the plates even without the missing part of the message. Behind books, third shelf secretary, Dr. S. 
Outside of the fact that Davidson hid the Bank of England plate somewhere in London, Mr. Holmes, I don't see that we've progressed at all. Allow me to point out to you, sir, the key words, Dr. S. It looks as if the plates were hidden in the house of the doctor. Whether S stands for his first or last initial remains to be determined by a process of elimination. Well, there must be 10,000 doctors in London with S for a first or last initial. Precisely. And every one of them will have to be questioned in person. That's why I say this is a task for Scotland Yard. It's a task, all right. But Scotland Yard has searched worse haystacks and found a needle. Well, for the time being, I'll leave the matter in your hands, gentlemen. We'll call you if and when we get a lead on our mysterious Dr. S. In the meantime, I intend to follow up a little clue concerning a cigarette. The next stop for Sherlock Holmes, Peterson's Tobacco Shop. You're certain of the identification of the tobacco? Absolutely. I have made up this special blend for only three customers. It is almost pure Egyptian, mm -hmm. with admixture of Latakia for added body, and a pinch of Perique. Merely a whisper, as one might say, for elusive fragrance. Yes, yes, and the, um, the three customers? Major Wilson in Bombay, India. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Catherine Leamington Smith mm -hmm. in Ireland. Yes, and the third? Mrs. Hilda Courtney of Park Mansions, Bryanston Square. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been most helpful. It is a pleasure to have been of service, Mr. Holmes. Armed with this latest information and eager to finally end the mystery, Sherlock Holmes paid a call on Hilda Courtney. Yes? Mrs. Courtney? Yes. Uh, my name is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, do come in. Thank you. I've heard of you, of course, Mr. Holmes. I believe we have a mutual friend in Sir Edward Brookdale. Oh, come now, Mrs. Courtney. You seem to forget that you and I have met before. I'm sorry. I'm sure I would have remembered meeting the great Sherlock Holmes. Please sit down. Thank you. You say we met before. Yes. At the home of Mr. and Mrs. Kilgore, 143B Hampton Road. Kilgore? I don't think I know anyone of that name. Well, I didn't say you knew them. As a matter of fact, you called on them when they were out. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Really? You were dressed rather differently. Indeed. You know, Mrs. Courtney, people generally forget in assuming a disguise. But the shape of the ear is an almost infallible means of recognition and identification to the trained eye. Evidently, you've mistaken me for someone else. Oh, no, not at all. Though, naturally, I expected your denial. But when you paid your visit to my rooms at Baker Street, you carelessly left behind another identification. You see, Mr. Holmes, to catch one as clever as you, I had to use a very special lure. I knew you'd be unable to resist the bait of my cigarette, having read with great interest your monograph on the ashes of 140 different varieties of tobacco. And that's when Colonel Cavanaugh appeared, placing a revolver square into the back of Sherlock Holmes. I should advise you not to move, Mr. Holmes. I must congratulate you on your ingenuity, Mrs. Courtney. It was indeed a brilliantly designed trap. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Praise from a master is indeed gratifying. I shall always cherish the memory of your flattering words. Memory? Precisely. I'm afraid these gentlemen have a most regrettable task to perform. Unless, of course, you care to turn over the missing musical box with your pledge to take no action against us in the future? I'm afraid that will be impossible. I thought that would be your answer. Honey, you realize, Mr. Holmes, that your demise will not take place here, the uh, corpus delecti, you know? Well, naturally. Shall we go? so fearfully awkward having a dead body lying about. Don't you agree, Mr. Holmes? Another dead body should weigh too heavily on your conscience, Mrs. Courtney. His hands bound, Holmes was led away by Colonel Kavanaugh and Hamine on his way to certain death. Dress to Kill will return in a moment. For 99... Now, let's get back to our Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dress to Kill, on Classic Movies on Radio. Taken to an abandoned garage, Sherlock Holmes was left manacled and gagged, dangling from a meat hook amidst a cloud of deadly gas. His demise would be quick and painless. But there was still life in the old boy yet. 
Having cleverly pickpocketed the handcuff keys from the jacket of Colonel Kavanaugh, Holmes quickly worked to free himself. Meanwhile, a heavily disguised Hilda Courtney paid a visit to the unsuspecting Dr. Watson. Good afternoon. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, I'm Dr. Watson. Oh, of course, Dr. Watson. How stupid of me. Oh, it's all stupid of me. <laughs> Won't you come in? Well, I, I really came to see Mr. Holmes. Oh, I'm afraid he's out. I don't know when he'll be back. Perhaps there's something I can do. My only sister has disappeared, and the local police seem utterly unable to find her. She's only 17, Dr. Watson, and until she disappeared last Thursday, she seemed to be in the best of spirits. Or possibly a romantic entanglement? Oh, no, no, nothing of the sort. She left no note, didn't even pack a bag, no explanation. She just started to walk to the village from our house in broad daylight and simply vanished from the face of the earth. Oh, there, 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 there. Might I have a glass of water? Glass of water, glass of water. As an enamored Dr. Watson leaves to get the water, Hilda Courtney places a smoke bomb in the cupboard. There you are, my dear. Thank you, Dr. Watson. No, 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 you're not to cry anymore. You must pull yourself together. I feel much better already knowing that you're going to help me. Oh, Dr. Watson, look! Good heavens! Fearing a fire, Dr. Watson instinctively reached for the biscuit jar, which concealed the elusive music box. That was all Hilda Courtney needed to see. As Watson ran for a fire extinguisher, she retrieved her treasure and slipped out the door amid the smoke and mayhem. Finally, she was in possession of all three boxes and the final piece to the musical puzzle. I hope you weren't too frightened, Miss Williams. Gone. It's a trouble with them. They always lose their heads in an emergency. <laughs> a musical box. Great Scott! With the music box gone, the outwitted Dr. Watson awaited with great trepidation the arrival of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, where on earth have you been? I've been trying to get you to the club, the Scotland Yard, all over London. You're looking for me in the wrong places. Holmes, a terrible thing's happened. I've been duped. That woman, she made a complete fool of me. Well, what do you mean? Well, she came here and let off a smoke bomb. I thought the whole place was on fire, and my first thought was to, to save the musical box. No need to say any more. She has the box. Yeah. Don't blame yourself too much, old fellow. She's an extremely clever antagonist. Smoke bomb, you said. <laughs> well, you can console yourself for the thought that your charming friend is at least a reader of yours. What do you mean? If I remember correctly, you wrote about my little experiment with smoke and the crime of fire in a story you entitled A Scandal in Bohemia, which has just appeared in the Strand magazine. All right, all right, old boy. Don't rub it in. But I may tear you up to know that you made a fool of me, too. Ah. That cigarette stub it was planted here for one express purpose. You're going to bandaging around this place. Bandaging? What's the matter, Holmes? You heard? An explanation will have to wait until later. At the moment, we're faced with a problem which I fear is insurmountable. Come over here, will you? Right. Our opponents are in possession of all three parts of the code. And here are we, while well, the Bank of England plates pass into their possession. Cheer up, old fellow, cheer up. As Dr. Samuel Johnson once said, there's no problem the mind of man can set that the mind of man cannot solve. What's that, old fellow? I was just quoting Dr. Samuel Johnson. He said there is Thank no... Thank Watson. Thank you. Hmm? The scene? The museum home of Dr. Samuel Johnson, the famous author and lexographer of the 1700s. Among the enthralled tour group, a trio of interested spectators, Hilda Courtney, Colonel Kavanaugh, and Hameen. Leaving the front reception room, we come into the main hall, where Dr. Johnson was in the habit of passing through to have his meager meals in the dining room opposite, in company with his friend and biographer, James Boswell. We will now pass up the stairway, which remains in its natural wood finish. Uh, this way, ladies and gentlemen, please, this way. Move along, children, move along. The secretary's not on this floor. Patience, I need... I have a feeling... My dear Colonel, with Sherlock Holmes out of the way, what could go wrong? As the tour moves slowly from room to room, the deceptive trio lag behind, awaiting their opportunity. Finally, 
they were alone, Kavanaugh took out his keys and was able to open the glass doors. No keys. Armed with the music box's secret code, they knew they'd find the missing plates. A few scant seconds, and the fortune would be theirs. Bird shelf up. But there was one more visitor on the tour that day. Well, Mr. Courtney, so we meet again. Sherlock Holmes pointed his gun at the trail. No, I shouldn't do that if I were you, Colonel Kavanaugh. I must congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. You're far more clever than I thought. Thank you, Mrs. Courtney. Praise from you is indeed gratifying. I shall always cherish the memory of your flattering words. Memory? And now I have a most regrettable task to perform. With a quick, skilled movement, Hamlin reached for his knife. The same deadly dagger that had killed Julian Emery several days before. But Sherlock Holmes was not about to meet the same ominous fate. The shot immediately summoned Dr. Watson and two inspectors from Scotland Yard positioned nearby. Holmes! Perfectly, thank you, old fellow, but I think this gentleman on the floor requires some medical attention. We must see that he looks his best, you know, when he's hanged. Take him in charge. A brilliant antagonist. It's a bit of a her talents were so misdirected. Will you see that these plates are returned to the Bank of England, Inspector? I still don't understand how you solved it, Mr. Holmes. It's entirely due to Dr. Watson. He gave me the clue when he mentioned Dr. Samuel Johnson. Well, congratulations, Doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. I don't think I'd have done it entirely without Mr. Holmes' help, you know. <laughs> You've been listening to the classic movies on radio presentation, Dress to Kill, starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. Classic Movies on Radio is copyright 1997 by American Entertainment Group.